Welcome to The Jeff Miller Show. Each week, Jeff Miller of The Jeff Miller Consulting Alliance talks with Podcast Village host Charlie Burney about trends in business, consulting, and much more. The Consulting Alliance offers strategic counsel and tactical support to businesses, corporations, and nonprofit organizations in the Washington, D.C. area and beyond. Well, here we are, Jeff, for another episode of The Jeff Miller Show. How are you this afternoon, my friend? I'm great, Charlie. How are you? Welcome to the almost finished, revamped Podcast Village studio. We've got the Apple TV. Oh, no, we had Apple TV last week when you were here. I'm still getting over the newness of the studio. Well, it's looking great. I want to see where we go to next, Jeff. Uh, and, and it's time for us to sort of talk about coaching, the business of coaching, the, the process of coaching. We've talked about measurement. We've talked about a whole bunch of different topics, uh, done some of the community outreach that you do. But now let's talk about the Jeff, and we've talked about the Jeff Miller Consulting Alliance, but what about the actual work of coaching? So it's an interesting thing. When I first started business coaching uh, 13 years ago, people mm-hmm. looked at me like I had a third eye. Uh, it didn't have any real traction. Uh, and it wasn't Halloween. No, it wasn't. Um, and obviously, through the years, that's changed. Mm. Through, through the downturn of 2008, 2007, 8, and 9, right. a lot of folks who lost their job actually went into coaching. Mm-hmm. So if you walk into a room now, half the room, it seems, are coaches of some sorts, <laughs> whether that's business coaching, life coaching, diet coaching, finance coaching, whatever it is, uh, which on one hand is good mm-hmm. because it's brought awareness to the brand. Right, of course. On the other hand, there's, there's a downside to it. And, and I'm, this is a long way of answering your no, question. Keep going. If you're going to get into coaching, consulting, working with business owners, you have to do it for the right reason. People are putting an awful lot of confidence in you, mm-hmm. not to mention a financial investment that they're making to work with you. Right. And at the end of the day, the first thing a coach has to have is the best interest for their clients first and foremost. Right. And that's not always the case, and, and that's a real issue. So the first thing that I would ask a new coach, mm-hmm. why? Why do you want to be coach? Why do you want to be coach? Yeah. yeah. What's, what's driving that? Because there needs to be a passion behind it. There needs mm-hmm. to be a purpose and a reason for it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that so, would be the first question. So if I asked you 13 years ago, Coaching. Jeff, really? Why do you want to do that? How would you answer that question? Because I wanted to make a difference in my community. See, that's, that's the right answer. Yeah. In, in, or one of the right answers. Empowering business owners, mm-hmm. uh, allowing them to taste and feel a better way, a better life, a better way of doing things, and having that trickle effect. Because if you have a happier business owner, mm-hmm. you have a happier family. If you have a happier family, you have happier classrooms. And that's how you build community, mm-hmm. you know, one person at a time. I've never, never, thought, I've never thought about it that, quite that yeah. way. You know, so. And as I've mentioned on previous uh, podcasts, my dad was a retailer in Manhattan. Right, right. Uh, in the shadows of where the World Trade Center were. And started selling rabbit air antennas, TV knobs, uh, vacuum t- radio tubes. Oh, and yeah. by the end, <laughs> it was sort of the advent of the home computer. Mm-hmm. But my point in, in bringing this up is that in any family where there's a business involved, mm-hmm. the effect on the family is constant. I the good times, concur. the bad times, the ups and the downs, we're all affected by it. Mm-hmm. So that was, mm-hmm. you asked why, yeah, yeah. and th- that's why, to change yeah. lives. But can part of that answer, once you've made that uh, determination, then you want to think about the kind of clients that you want to work with. It's probably not everyone. I'm assuming you you know it's probably pretty wide, uh, and I've seen you do a lot of different kinds of clients, but talk to me a little bit about business coaching and, and clients. So I made an intentional decision to not build the business vertically mm-hmm. based on concentrating on one industry. Mm-hmm. It was important to me when I started that the methodology that I learned at the time, certified in at the time, that it worked across the board. Mm-hmm. that it would work with any business that I would encounter. So I intentionally built the business that way and through the years have literally worked with almost any kind of okay. uh, mm-hmm. you know, industry, profession that you could think of. I mean, even now, I'm working with an endocrinologist, mm-hmm. uh, you know, work, working with attorneys, working with engineers, working with trades. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the past, I've worked with a, a husband and wife 
Vegas style swing band. <laughs> well, I'll give them a plug. Orchestra, yeah. Orchestra King Radio. Okay, we're gonna have to look that up and put that in the notes. Orchestra King Radio. Yeah. Okay. Ro- Robin and Rick. And great. of course, you also work uh, with the prison system with helping people get back in, involved in society. So it really is a wide range. You know? Well, one, once you develop the skill set, um, it's something that you don't take it on and off. It, it it becomes who you are. You know, we talked. To, I think we talked a couple back about. Um, mindfulness Mm -hmm. and being mindful and it's not about work-life balance it's about work-life integration right 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 so you are who you are i am who i am uh which for the most part is good i mean if you ask betsy and the girls (laughs) they they may tell you that i'm not asking those (laughs) (laughs) wish you would take the the the, the whistle out of his mouth every once in a while (laughs) i can't imagine that at all well, uh, then, um, then what about goals, Jeff? As a as a beginning uh, business consultant, you're helping you're helping clients and trying to make a difference. But we're, we've also got to orient your success and business consulting success over goal setting. So, how do we sort of re- reaffirm that definition and, and what those goals are? When a client works with me, for the most part, uh, they want to go from a place of good mm-hmm. to a place of better. That sounds good. Mm-hmm. Um, they typically have already moved from the pain to the good. So now it's about really getting to that next level with the business. You can't do that if you don't set goals. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You, can't, you can't measure something if it's not committed to. Mm-hmm. And everybody talks about this. It certainly isn't uh, proprietary information f- sure. for me, but sure. when you talk about goals, you talk about smart goals. Mm-hmm. So they're specific, they're measurable, they're achievable, they're results-oriented, and mm-hmm. they're within the right time frame. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I may have shared this uh, previously, but there was a study done uh, at Harvard Business School in 1978 where they interviewed that class, all financial folks, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, the question was, who had goals? Mm-hmm. Who had goals that were written down? Mm-hmm. Rough numbers, 80% of the class had no goals. 17% had goals, but they were only verbalized. Mm-hmm. 3% had goals that were written down. 10 years later, they go to the same, that same group, and now they're all out there working financial services. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The 80% were making what the industry was making. Okay. Okay. The 17% was out earning by two, the 80%. Okay. The 3% mm-hmm. were outperforming by 10. Were out earning by 10. Wow. So that's what, a pretty significant change. And that they, only happens yeah. if you have those goals. Yeah. Now, there's a lot of work in that, and uh, there's a lot of work to set, to set the goals mm-hmm. to begin with. But if you can write goals down, and mm-hmm. then if you can give it to an accountability person, whether mm-hmm. it's your consultant, your coach, your wife, mm-hmm. I mean, I write goals down all the time and there are mm-hmm. two people who I give it to one is Betsy mm-hmm. and the other is my coach Mark Richardson because okay. I know the two of them are going to keep me accountable right right well I definitely I uh, as an aside I definitely concur with using your wife <laughs> as one of your consultants because I'm doing the same thing now yeah. and she says why are you doing that and I'm like come out of my where I'm at and I swim up to the top and I realize she's looking at this differently and maybe she's right so I value her opinion a, a great deal because I I get so down deep into this stuff, I forget mm-hmm. about you know uh, the other. So I think that's absolutely fascinating. Before you set the goals, uh, this is what I, what I do. Uh, in fact, I've got time blocked off next week, a couple of hours, to think about 2016. Mm-hmm. Not to set goals, mm-hmm. just okay. to think about it, to okay. ruminate over it. What's it look like? What's it feel like? Mm-hmm. Uh, are there parts of the business I want to expand? Are there mm-hmm. parts of the business I want to you know, maybe let go of? Mm-hmm. Uh, and to approach it, literally to approach it from a strategic right. standpoint. So right. that's, that's a step before the goal setting. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There's another challenge that we have because we tend to dream small. Mm-hmm. And any goal starts with a dream. It starts with a vision. Yeah. So how much clarity do you have around your vision. Your vision, okay. What's that look like? What's that feel like? What's that smell like? In fact, I was at, up at the prison today doing my thing, oh my gosh. and we were talking about vision. Mm-hmm. And whether you're sitting behind bars, whether you're running a $5 million retail shop or $50 million mm-hmm. uh, firm, you need to have a vision for where you want to go. Mm-hmm. 
Because mm-hmm. as we all know, five years from now, we'll be somewhere. Right. So you might as well have an active take in it. And uh, let me just throw you a curveball then. In your experience with working with... Uh, I never could hit the curveball, Joe. <laughs> See how well, I, do. I probably can't throw it, <laughs> but uh, but uh, you're working with two entirely different groups of the community: the the guys who are trying to make a new, fresh start coming out of the prison system, and regular business people. You know, guys like you and me. So, do you find that the the goal visioning is sort of everybody does have a goal or a, you know a kernel of a concept of where they want to be? Is that kind of common, or or does it seem to skew differently in those? two general groups. I would just be curious. I would think sometimes those guys really have, they really want to get out and they really want to get to this next level. I would think maybe they'd be having more. So interesting because oftentimes when I ask people what their personal goals are, Mm -hmm. and this is true, I'm talking now across the board, um, they'll look at me and say, you know, no one ever asked me that question. Hmm. I mean, I've had times where going through this process of trying to understand where they were, where they are, where they want to go, right. both in terms of the business, but also personal growth. Right. I can't tell you that there have been times where I've actually, people have stopped, they've gotten teary-eyed, and they take stock of the fact that, wow, I haven't thought about that, if ever, but yeah. certainly not for a long, long time. So I, I think there's, you don't, in this instance, don't need to differentiate between any of the population. Mm-hmm. I think it's something, unfortunately, that as a society, mm-hmm. uh, we don't, we certainly don't teach it in school. Right. No. And we certainly don't teach it to the middle class or, 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 or obviously right. m- those m- more needy. Um, no, because they just have to, you know, get a blue collar job and work, work till they die. No, I'm, I'm overstating it. Yeah. But one of the images that jumped into my mind as you were talking about this, about goals versus just and thinking about the person who who is stopped short by that question is the way marketing has changed our perception. So years ago, there was the campaign with the Ever Ready Bunny. Mm-hmm. And so, so forgive my analogy, but when, when you're talking, I'm thinking, we saw that, we saw performance being keyed in symbolically to go, go, go. He didn't have a goal. He right. just went, right? He there just was no went. Fin- no finish line. There was no finish line. He would turn, he would go, he would go really fast, remember? But the, my point being, if I have one, is that um, that rabbit didn't have a goal. And it also patterned people like the people you ask who get stopped short that, you know, just running really hard is what you should be doing. And that's not really what you should be doing. And you need to have an end. It, it's, you know? a, it's a great analogy because so many, especially small businesses, are run that way. Yeah. You're just going from fire to fire Spr- to sprinting, fire. Sprinting, you know, fire. living in quadrant one or however you want to say and, it. Yeah. And that concept of strategic planning, the concept of working, which Michael Gerber talks about in the E-Myth, of course, um, the concept of working on the business, mm-hmm. not always in the business. Because mm-hmm. if you work only in the business, you're kind of going to grow to not like that business very much. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I think that's, you know, that that's also a, a critical uh point to mention is that yeah if you're just going around in circles there's no end game right by definition right you're not going to you're not going to create a success yeah yeah so one of the methodology of coaching uh that i that that i've been certified in for executive coaching Mm -hmm. deals with how to uncover limiting beliefs that people have or the the things that are holding them back Mm -hmm. and to go back to your original question about why do you get into coaching or what do you need to be successful at with coaching? You need to understand that this is not a cookie cutter business, not one size fits all. And you need to understand that you will spend more time coaching the individual than you will the business. Because if you don't do that, nothing will happen in the business. Mm -hmm. And and I want to, again, be clear because I I always want to stress this, um, because there are a lot of people out there calling themselves all, all types of things. Business coaching is not life coaching. Right. Business consulting isn't life consulting. Okay. So it's always based on results. Mm-hmm. Nobody brings me on and keeps me on mm-hmm. because they like me. Mm-hmm. They like me sure. sometimes, sure. but I'm their coach. They don't even have to like me. Right. They bring me on and they keep me on because there are results at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. There's a direction, there's growth, whether that's 
measured by sales. Or simply making decisions, you know. Yeah. Yep. Decision yeah. making is a, is a big thing. Helping yeah. people understand yeah. they may need to make that decision a little bit quicker. Mm-hmm. Um, so again, mm-hmm. whether you're looking at sales numbers, whether you're looking at revenue, whether you're looking at profitability, whether you're looking at production from the team, mm-hmm. whatever you're looking at in the business, all that stuff has to be measured. Right. And right. almost all of it can be measured quantifiably. Mm-hmm. So what's mm-hmm. the system that you have in place? You know, what are you testing and what are you measuring on an ongoing basis? Right. And that's one of the major uh, roles that any good coach or consultant plays. But right. you can't get to that point if you can't help the business owner grow mm-hmm. and see things and look at things differently. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. One of the things we were talking about clients earlier, mm-hmm. I mean, frankly, and it, it sounds, maybe it sounds silly, but I've been saying it for 13 years and I've had some you know, a fair modicum of success here. Yes, uh, you the first thing that I look for in a business owner, do they understand the value of self-investment? Do they mm. want to grow not only as a business, but are they willing to stretch the limits? Are they willing to expand their comfort zone? Mm-hmm. Are they willing to take themselves from, okay, what do I know now to what don't I know? And mm-hmm. what do I need to work on next? I mean, that, there's a cycle of, you know, kind of how you learn in life. You start with, incompetent, uh, unconscious incompetency. Mm -hmm. You don't know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. Then you've got competent incompetency. So I'm sitting on dad's lap. My hands are on the steering wheel, but I can't drive the car. Then you have conscious competency. I'm driving, but I'm still thinking about that clutch and going uphill and not rolling backwards. And then you have unconscious competency. Now now I'm just driving, not thinking about it. Yeah. So learning in life happens when you're willing Mm -hmm. to take yourself back down to unconscious incompetency. What don't I know now? And if somebody's willing to go down that journey with me, man, I want to work with them. Yeah. And and I I apologize. I'm going to ask you a pointed question there. Have you found people who don't want to take that journey? Sure. You do come across people who are like, no, I don't need to do that. Yeah, I think... I think... I mean, it has to have happened. Yeah. Well, and I'll, I'll answer the, the question as pointedly. I, th- I think there are more people like that than not. Yeah. And again, it has to do with how we're socialized. It's how we're educated. It's coming to life from a place of scarcity as opposed to abundance. Sure. And when you're dealing with scarcity, that's a cycle that in business and in life can really eat you alive. Mm-hmm. Because if there are two kinds of survival. Um, and there's two kind of fitness, right? And it's being fit is important. But if I shook you in the middle of the night and said, hey, Charlie, complete this sentence, blank of the fittest. Survival. Survival. Yeah. So we come to this from survival. Mm-hmm. If you're thinking about surviving, the only place you can really go from survival is to measurement, okay? Sure. Me and you are locked in this room. Yep. We only have one cup of water. Yeah, I'm going to fight Uh-oh. you. Uh-oh. Yeah. <laughs> and so if you, once you go to measurement, the only yeah. place you can go to is fear. Right. What happens when it runs out? Yeah. And from fear, you go to scarcity. And that cycle plays itself out every day, all the time. And how's that model working? Mm-hmm. There are over mm-hmm. 100 conflicts in the world. Right. In, in, the, in America, in 2015, we have hungry people. I mean, how's it working? So you need to break that paradigm mm-hmm. because if you're going from scarcity, then you're dreaming from scarcity, which is probably a nightmare. Um, and you're living, you're setting goals from scarcity. Mm-hmm. And it's, a, it, it's, not, it's not the place to be and it's not the place where I want to work with people. Right. Because right. There, it, in this day and age, we can create anything that we desire to create. Mm-hmm. If we spent more time trying to figure it out and less time killing each other, uh, we'd figure out how to feed people. We could do a lot of things. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean we to get... Do, I, we could do... We could really go down a rabbit hole there. <laughs> I, I, I didn't mean to get on, my, on a soapbox there, yeah. but I think it's, for me, um, it's almost criminal yeah. to not look at life and say, wow, this is a wonderful, beautiful thing. How do I maximize this? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that doesn't always mean from a material standpoint. I mean, materialism is, is okay. There's a place sure. for it and everybody likes to have nice things and there's nothing wrong with that. Yep. But I'm talking about a life that's even broader than that. Mm-hmm. Maximizing. Mm-hmm. Um, I've got my coach, I, I mention my coach often because he's a, just a, 
uh, wonderful influence and, and, and mentor for me, he talks about touching greatness. Mm-hmm. Like, what does it feel like to touch greatness? Mm-hmm. People don't even think that way. No, they really don't. When I ask that question, people look at me again like, I don't understand that, that language. And without going into detail, about a month and a half ago, I had occasion to touch greatness mm-hmm. for about half a day. Mm-hmm. And I haven't been the same since. And, and, and that touching greatness had nothing to do with, with making money or it had nothing to do with a client's success. It had to do with something that I was able to achieve that I'd been working for for a long time. And a lot of things came together at once. And man, I felt amazing. So if I can feel that and if I can help pass that on to the people I work with, the clients I work with, the businesses, the team members that I work with, and my community at large, and build a community based upon that. Right. Be a be a really cool place a to cool live, place Charlie. To live, right. Yeah. yeah. No. Yeah. I'm, I I hear you. I like the, I like what you're saying, Jeff. Well, I um, well we've taken a look at sort of the the uh, the nuts and bolts of coaching, and I I love it. Uh, I I know we're going to want to delve deep into it, but but about the soapbox, don't be afraid to get on the soapbox every once in a while on this show, uh, Jeff, because it's it's fun to hear that when we get passionate enough to talk about something. What, uh, so yeah, I mean, I think you know me well enough. I've, <laughs> I've never met a soapbox I don't like. I mean, listen, a lot of what I'm doing with the prison system right. has to do with being on that soapbox. Is this the best yeah. we can do? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the being the president of the corporate volunteer council of, of Montgomery County, right, right, making helping businesses to understand that they've got a responsibility to create volunteer opportunities mm-hmm. for their team. There's a business case for that. Yep. Right. Yep. Happier team members, less churn. There's yep. And mm-hmm. you've got employee retention. Yep. But you also have the obligation to give back to the community that you live in. Exactly. Oh boy. So I, yeah, I yes. Yeah, like know, I, I said, I, I like to talk about that. So, yeah. <laughs> well, that's wonderful. I think we're right up against it for this week, Jeff. And thank you. I know that um, hopefully we can interview your mentor sometime and do some other things. It would be nice to do that because I like it when you bring him up and because I have my people that I look up to and I always enjoy hearing who other people and learning about them. So There's, one, yeah. one go, other no, thing along, along those yeah. lines, um, other things that I advise new coaches, particularly when I'm coaching them, mm-hmm. which I have certification to do that, it's critical that as a coach, you have a coach. Mm-hmm. For a couple of reasons. Number one, you don't always see, obviously, your own blind spots. Right. Number two, it brings an element of accountability, and and that's critical for for anybody. And maybe the most important reason, or as important a reason, you realize how humbling it is Mm -hmm. to be the client. Right. And to have to say no. Right. Or, oh, I didn't think of that. Or... Oh man, it's Friday. Jeff's going to come around again. Yeah. So to be as effective as you can be, to be on top of the game, mm-hmm. it's only because you're working with somebody who's holding you to the same standard that you're holding your clients to. Mm-hmm. So if there are any new coaches out there listening, mm-hmm. uh, get yourself a coach. Mm-hmm. And then the other side of that, let me just jump in on the other side of that. A few years ago, I may have mentioned to you, I did a lot of, of Covey work. And uh, in the beginning of the episode, I thought of the adage from The Seven Habits, which is begin with the end in mind. Always. Which, you know, Always. And in terms of coaching, what you just said, uh, a coach having a coach, um, I remember one of the things was, you know, once I've learned something, can I teach it? And you learn so much by teaching something. I've taught guitar to a couple of people. And it's really fascinating when I do it because I've forgotten that part. I've forgotten how, you know, to think about holding your hand or to think about how do you do this quickly, whatever it may be. You learn a lot. I I completely agree. You learn a lot by teaching or coaching or being, you know, looking at the other end of that relationship. Um, But it's something to remind yourselves of. And and consciously, I'm reminding myself of that. I'm not coaching anyone right now, but uh, but I am teaching people how to podcast. So actually, I learned a lot. I taught one of the young men how to do the run the show last night. And I, I was looking at it from the other end of the spectrum. And I realized, wow, there's these are the things that are involved in it. How can I do this so it'll make sense? I just do it by muscle memory now, but how can I create well, and that? And that's a fundamental uh, principle of coaching, mm-hmm. is how do you systematize, again, going back to Michael Gerber and the e how do you systematize 
everything in the business that can be mm-hmm. systematized. Mm-hmm. How do you create the processes? Mm-hmm. You only need to train, train a piece of paper one time. I like that. <laughs> and and, and we, we tend to sometimes overcomplicate the system that we put in place so that you may have it, but it's so darn complicated that yeah. you don't implement it. A- absolutely. Yeah. So anytime you can help somebody to systematize and document a process, mm-hmm. well, you only have to do that one time. Yeah, yeah. And uh, that's, well you know, again, a very real principle of, of, of coaching and consulting. And, and at the end of the day, those are the types of things that your client's going to look at to say, uh, why am I paying Jeff again? That's right. Yeah. It's because we got stuff in place. Because we got stuff in place. Yeah. Look, look, here's why. This, yeah. this, this, yeah. and and by the way, these other five things. Oh, and by the way, we did this too. My gosh, why? How can we afford not to have a business coach? Uh, now, no. you know, we started we, earlier talking about goals. Uh, it's n- more advice to to any of the coaches out there: the day that you don't know what your client's goals are, is the day that you'll lose that client. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm sure it happens. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you, Jeff. This has been wonderful. Thank you so much. Charlie, it's a pleasure uh, as always. We'll we'll look forward to the next thing, and who knows what technological things we've got in store for our listeners in the new year. Yeah, I heard something about blabbing. I I don't know. Blabbing, (laughs) something like that. Video, who knows what's going to happen. Anyway, have a wonderful weekend, and uh, talk to you next time. Sounds good. 